Hello everyone, my name is Tom Kearns and I host the Anglo-Saxon England podcast, where I cover the history and culture of England from the departure of the Romans in the 5th century to the Norman Conquest in 1066. On the podcast, so far we've surveyed the collapse of Roman rule in Britain, the migration of the Anglo-Saxons, and have surveyed the history of Northumbria from its beginnings in the mists of legend to its destruction at the hands of Viking raiders in the 9th century. The podcast is available wherever podcasts are found, and on its website, anglosaxonenglandpodcast.podbean.com. I hope you'll come and give it a go. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode's tension arose between the British and the Ashanti yet again. The Dutch traded away their territories in Ghana to the British in exchange for concessions elsewhere. This enraged the Ashantahene Kofi Kakari, who believed that the Dutch had no right to trade away land that they had been leasing from the Ashanti, and feared that the trade would make the Ashanti economically dependent on the British. After tense deliberations and a failed hostage negotiation, the die was cast. In 1873, the Third Anglo-Ashanti War proceeded. Season 3, Episode 23, The Third Anglo-Ashanti War Part 1, 1873. The wet season of 1873 was a period of patriotic fervor in the Ashanti Empire. In May, the Ashanti Manchiamu had resolved that war with the British was now a reality. To mark the occasion, Ashanti soldiers, their skin painted with a bright red hue, marched in a patriotic parade through the capital of Komasi. Overseeing the ceremony was the Ashanti Hene Kofi Kakari, and, as the troops passed him by, they would scramble into formation and fire off a salute before continuing on their way. The peasantry, and even slaves of the empire, were given a day off to join in the festivities. They lined the streets of Komasi, eating, drinking, dancing, and generally celebrating the occasion of the onset of war. Meanwhile, at the royal palace, a group of death row inmates were arranged in a line, and then each shot or strangled to death. A ceremony meant to bring good fortune to the Ashanti military as they embarked towards the coast. In June, an Ashanti army 80,000 men strong crossed the Pra River. The Ashanti army was led by the aging general Aman Kwasha, who was confident in Ashanti chances of victory. Sure, the British possessed better quality weapons, but that had been the case in the last two wars as well. And, just like in the last two wars, the superior Ashanti discipline, mobility, and logistical organization would be more than enough to overcome the British's minor technological advantage. Before departing Komasi, Aman Kwasha swore an oath to the Ashantihene that he would bring him back a chunk of the wall of Cape Coast as a trophy. The Ashanti army was divided into two columns. One 60,000-man army would invade the former Dutch territories and capture the central point of contention in the war, the city of Elmina. The plan was to then march from Elmina to Cape Coast and sever the British's main supply port. A second, smaller force of 20,000 would march further east and capture Accra, the other main British port. If all went according to plan, the British army would then be forced to land ships at inferior quality ports like Anomabo, Salt Pond, or Winaba. They would then be further delayed by the poor state of roads in those areas, allowing the Ashanti to take advantage of this logistical quagmire. Unlike in the Ashanti Empire, roads in central Fantiman were still largely just minor hunting paths. While the British were preoccupied sluggishly hauling supplies through these vine and brush-covered forests, the Ashanti would receive supplies through consistent, well-maintained roads, giving them a distinct advantage. The plan made sense. At first, the strategy went off without a hitch. The British had been slow to prepare for war, and were caught off guard by the rapid movement and healthy state of supply of the Ashanti armies. The largest British army moved north, aiming to intercept Amonkwasha's main force and slow their advance. The two armies never exactly met in battle. The British lieutenant commanding the army, realizing that he would certainly lose any attack that he mounted against the larger and better supplied Ashanti, decided to take a Fabian approach, gradually falling back and setting up defensive positions to force the Ashanti to prepare for battle, only to immediately retreat. This tactic slowed the Ashanti advance, for a few weeks. By May, the only major city that stood between the advancing Ashanti and Cape Coast, the old capital of the Denshira at Jukwa, fell to Amon Kwasha's army. By July, the Ashanti had reached Almina and captured some of the outskirts of the city. In the east, the Ashanti had similar success. After a few months of minor skirmishes, the Ashanti had advanced close to Accra, capturing the nearby town of Mampon, not to be confused with the northern Ashanti city, Mampong. Unlike the vast majority of local kings who fiercely sided with the British, 
The king of Mampon decided that collaboration with the Ashanti would be a better option for him in the long run. He gave the Ashanti access to desperately important food supplies, ordered his subjects to help the Ashanti clear the roads north, and even proclaimed that he would personally lead a small band of his own soldiers on the field of battle. With the assistance of this local king, Mampon was transformed, essentially, into an enormous battlefield camp, and the primary supply hub of the Eastern Campaign. From there, the Ashanti continued advancing south towards Accra, intent on capturing the major port. With the Ashanti quickly advancing on all fronts, the British administrators in the colony entered into panic mode. They scrambled, requesting any sort of assistance from the home country that the British could possibly muster. The response was a clear commitment to defend the remaining areas under British control. To lead this campaign, the British government sent the best available general in the empire, a man by the name of Garnet Wolseley. Wolseley was kind of a big deal. His first notable military service took place as a commission officer in the second British invasion of Burma in Southeast Asia, where he had apparently served quite well. In 1854, his career changed to that of an army engineer. He served during the Crimean War, at first designing and digging trenches and fortifications, but when he was wounded on the battlefield by a Russian bullet, he was transferred to a safer position, overseeing the shipment of soldiers and supplies in and out of Crimea. It was during this war that Wolseley would earn a reputation that would stick with him for the rest of his life, that he was a master of army organization and logistics. Sure, he wouldn't do much to wow you on the battlefield, but when it came to managing supplies and ensuring integrity of reinforcements, he was your man. In fact, he received not only British, but also French and Turkish honors for his services in Crimea. After the war, he served during the Sepoy Revolt of 1857, before transferring to Canada where he helped put down a series of First Nation revolts and a group of Irish-American militias. From there, he was prompted to adjunct general, and this would be his position in the Anglo-Ashanti War. And to quickly note, after this war, he would go on to lead British troops in Egypt, Sudan, South Africa, and Cyprus. Basically, if there was a part of planet Earth that the British colonized, Wolseley was almost certainly there at some point. Appropriately for a corporeal embodiment of imperialism, Wolseley was also extremely racist, even by the standards of the time. In his memoirs, he regularly refers to people fighting both against him and the locals that fought on his behalf with all sorts of vile names and phrases, most of which I cannot and am not willing to say on the show. Also, fittingly, he even looked like the personification of 19th century imperialism, with a long mustache, waxed back hair, and a cork helmet to boot. No, really, I posted pictures of him on the podcast blog, and I cannot emphasize how much he looks like a character from a political cartoon. Due to the fear of disease spreading during the wet season, the British plan was initially to wait until December to start sending reinforcements to Ghana. When Wolseley arrived in Cape Coast for preliminary planning in October, though, he was not prepared for the absolute disaster he walked into. Since he had last received updates in July, the situation which the British faced had only grown more desperate. In the east, the Ashanti had inched ever closer towards Accra. They had recently captured the town of Adafoa, and had even surrounded and killed much of the British garrison there. They had yet to take the city of Accra, but it seemed like just a matter of time. Meanwhile, and unusually, the British struggled to find recruits among the local people. Remember, by this point it had only been about a decade since the British had fought and lost the Second Anglo-Ashanti War. British failures in that conflict had left them in a bad state in terms of trust with their local allies. Remember, for much of the early stage of that war, the British had been content to sit back and watch as the Ashanti ravaged their way through Achem and Fanti towns. So, um, why should they side with you? This had done a lot to undermine trust between these peoples and the British. Remember, not so long ago, this lack of trust had almost resulted in the implementation of self-rule in the colony, and the near end of British direct influence in Ghana altogether. If you want to learn more about the revolutionary movement to create a self-governing Fonti Confederacy in coastal Ghana, you can check out our premium series on the podcast Patreon. While it got hit with some delays due to my catching COVID recently, don't worry, I'm fine, we just put out part two of the series and will be putting out part three on the same day as this episode's release. Also, I recently revised some elements of the Patreon, as you might have noticed, our podcast host recently started integrating ads into episodes. I'm not sure how I feel about this yet, I might turn it off or leave it on. Regardless, I decided to start uploading ad-free versions of the show's Patreon available for anyone who pledges at the $3 or more level, 
Additionally, I recently added a new feature for supporters. At the end of every month, myself and my editor will put out a more off-the-cuff, behind-the-scenes show where we will address patron questions, share stuff about the podcast-making process, reflect on the historiography, review the sources used in the episode, bring out some of our more general thoughts on the month's episode, and more than that. This behind-the-scenes show will be available for anyone who pledges at $5 or more. So if that interests you, or if you just want to listen to the premium episodes, ad-free content, or if you just want to support this program and the education we provide, then sign up to support us at patreon.com slash historyofafrica. I made the choice to continue my education recently, and as a result, I will be living on nothing but a humble stipend for a while. So all of your support has been super duper helpful in making sure that this show keeps running. And to those of you already supporting the show, thank you. Among the majority of the Fonti and Ga, the local kings stayed ostensibly loyal to the British, though much more apprehensive about aiding them materially or on the battlefield. Why should I, a Fonti king, send my subjects to go die under the command of one of your incompetent generals like last time, right? So, compared to the Second Anglo-Ashanti War, local cooperation with the British was actually much less enthusiastic. It didn't help that Wolseley completely misunderstood this apprehension as characteristic African laziness. Because, of course he did. And as a result, made no effort to actually increase this confidence in the British. This mistrust for the British became even more apparent the further away you got from Cape Coast. When Wolseley called for a convention of all native rulers of the British Gold Coast, less than half showed up. When he sent out letters to those who hadn't attended, many never bothered to write back. One Akopim noble, whose hometown was just down the road from the Ashanti's base at Mampon, responded to Wolseley's letter by claiming that he was sick with smallpox and that he would totally meet with Wolseley tomorrow. He then immediately bolted to Mampon with his family and subjects, where he pledged undying loyalty to the Ashanti. I just think that story is hilarious. Meanwhile, Aman Kwasha's 60,000 men sat menacingly, just a few hours' march away from Cape Coast. To prepare for the attack, Wolseley ordered a census of the city and its surroundings to see how many men would be ready for service if the city's defense was called for. The answer was a little over a hundred. Shocked, he requested a similar census of Accra. Obviously, Cape Coast wouldn't hold without reinforcements, so we'd have to request some from the east. So, how many men did he find out were available and ready for service? Twelve. Twelve dudes. If Aman Kwasha launched an attack on Elmina and Cape Coast, the British were doomed. To Wolseley, it must have seemed like the war was already lost by the time he arrived. But then it wasn't. Aman Kwasha's army advanced to the outskirts of Elmina and then just kind of stopped. Why? Well, back in September, the Ashanti general ordered a small scouting party to probe the British defenses around Elmina and get a sense of what was going on there. There, they skirmished with a small British force, in a battle that didn't prove particularly conclusive. When they came back, Aman Kwasha was shocked by their reports. He was told that the new British repeating rifles were far more advanced than he had imagined. Unlike Ashanti breech loaders, which fired off one shot and then needed to be reloaded, the British rifles could fire off multiple rounds from a single magazine. This made their effective rate of fire several times faster than what the Ashanti could muster. The Ashanti standard issue of the time was a modification of the 1844 Enfield Carbine, a rifle that was relatively modern. However, many in the army were still equipped with older, smoothbore weapons, muskets more appropriate for a war fought in 1824, not 1874. These smoothbore muskets were remarkably inaccurate beyond a range of a few meters. This is the main reason why Ashanti military tactics had historically favored rushing down and encircling enemy armies, getting them into a kill zone where you could fire at short range when they were clumped together. When the scouting party returned, they brought back terrifying news of this technological disparity. In reality, the disparity was present, but not overwhelmingly so. It's not like the Ashanti hadn't overcome British technological advances before, I mean, they had just 10 years ago. The Ashanti outnumbered the British by a considerable margin, so they could definitely push on and capture the city with ease. But Aman Kwasha didn't, and it's not super clear why. Maybe the reports of the skirmishes just really freaked him out, or maybe he was under the impression that British numbers in Cape Coast were much greater than they really were. Remember, the entire strategy he had drawn up relied on the idea of capturing key British strategic positions quickly before they could mobilize a defense. 
Perhaps Amonquasha believed that the British reinforcements had already started to arrive, which would make any attack on the city much harder. In October, just as Wolseley was bracing for the worst, Amonquasha decided that instead of pressing his advantage, he'd travel back to Kumasi. Upon returning to Kumasi, the general met with the Ashantahene and told Kakari that there was no way he could capture Cape Coast, so Kakari should just give up and seek peace with the British. This statement was pretty baffling. After all, this whole war was pretty much Amon Quash's idea in the first place. He had been the principal agent pushing Kakari to declare war, and had made so many promises of Ashanti invincibility and how he would bring back a chunk of the Wall of Cape Coast. So, are you kidding me? This whole war was your idea to begin with, and now you're going to come to me and say that you want to give up when you haven't even fought a single battle. What are you even doing here? Go back to the battlefield now. So Amon Quasha returned to the front, where his army continued to just sit outside Almina doing nothing. So far, the course of this conflict has mirrored pretty closely the Second Anglo-Ashanti War. The Ashanti invaded the coast, had some early victories, the British were slow to mobilize, but the Ashanti failed to occupy any important objectives for long. But, due to Amon Quasha's failure to commit an attack, the British were able to scramble together a desperate defense. In late October, a group of crucial arrivals touched down in Cape Coast that would prove to be the essential turning point of the Third Anglo-Ashanti War. These were a group of mercenaries from northern Nigeria, the Hausa people. At the time, the preeminent state in northern Nigeria was the Sokoto Caliphate, a state we'll encounter a lot when we conclude the season with an extra-long special episode all about the Fulani Jihads. This state was, at the time, independent of British authority, but British influence in the region still existed in the form of missionary communities. When Wolseley had seen the desperate state of affairs when he arrived in the Gold Coast, he demanded that the colonial authorities bring in some West African backup, as European soldiers would take too long to arrive and, in line with the racialist views of the time, would probably just die in the forest heat anyways. So the colonial government sent out a line to the missionaries in northern Nigeria, who recruited around 700 Hausa mercenaries who the British happily ferried to Cape Coast in late October. Now, 700 men might not seem like a lot, but when you consider that the British could barely muster 100 otherwise, that is a sevenfold increase in manpower, until there were several thousand serving, and throughout the war, they would prove to be among the most effective fighting forces in the conflict. They were well-disciplined, brave, and well-supplied. They were also known for being exceptionally merciless compared to the British or Ashanti. You see, the British and Ashanti, while enemies and rivals, didn't really have a deep-seated hatred for one another in the same way that existed between the Fanti and Ashanti at the time. So, when British and Ashanti soldiers in the past had surrendered to each other, we'll see that at least during the early stage of this war, both sides had taken prisoners. There are numerous anecdotes on the early stages of the war of Ashanti and British soldiers not only being spared after capture and battle, but receiving relatively humane treatment during their custody. The mercenaries, on the other hand, didn't play that way. This brutality was largely due to two factors. For starters, they were mercenaries. Think about the type of person who willingly decides, yeah, I'll go off to some foreign country and kill people for cash. That sounds like a swell idea. Do you think that sounds like someone who would be more or less violent than the average person? Not to mention, everyone they were killing were foreigners, so there were no real social consequences for what they were doing, as news would likely never reach back home about their violent escapades. The British payment system also encouraged this intense violence and inhumanity. The mercenaries were paid bonuses for any confirmed kills, regardless of context, so they'd jump at the opportunity to collect some extra cash by executing a wounded or surrendered soldier. While British officers often feigned outrage about the uncivilized nature of these mercenaries, or in the case of some lower-level officers, felt genuinely bad for the Ashanti that the mercenaries were brutalizing, it's important to remember that it was their military who had set up this pay scale and had brought these guys to Ghana in the first place. So it was their military that was responsible. And it worked out for them. This relationship was a major boon for the British. When it came to negotiating with Ashanti soldiers, they could basically play good cop using the threat of handing them over to the Hausa to extract intelligence and cooperation from captured enemy soldiers. In early November, after weeks of unproductive skirmishing and British numbers growing, Amon Quasha finally decided that it was now or never, and ordered an attack on the city of Elmina. The British, however, were by this point well bolstered by the Hausa mercenaries. At first, the Ashanti made progress in taking the city. 
the British and Hausa were driven back out of most of the city proper, and were forced to make a last stand at Elmina Castle. However, when Aman Quasha's men attempted to scale the walls, they were repulsed, taking more than a hundred casualties in the process. He attempted to mount another attack on the city's fort. This attack was far less orderly. Before they had reached the castle, they encountered a much smaller British Infanti army on a forested path near the city that was attempting to reinforce the men in the castle. Neither side was expecting this battle, so both sides went into a panic state. The Ashanti army fanned out, attempting its regular encirclement tactics on the British. However, the officers commanding the wings were never quite able to get the angle that they wanted, so they never tried to commit to an attack. The dense flora surrounding the trail, neither the British nor the Ashanti could get a clean shot at the other, so they just kind of fired their guns at nothing. This undisciplined skirmish went on for about an hour, and at least according to British reports, several thousand shots were fired, and nobody was killed or hurt on either side. This type of battle, if you can even call it that, would become common throughout early November and December, and it achieved little on either side. For the Ashanti, it was a very efficient way to waste ammunition, which was not exactly an infinite supply. While November saw the British receive reinforcements, the month was a disaster for the Ashanti. Notably, Jiqua and Mampon were both hit hard by outbreaks of smallpox. Of the 60,000 Ashanti soldiers at Jiqua, about a third of them were either killed by the disease or sent back to Komasi to recover, including many skilled and important officers. Supply issues were also starting to rear their head. The Ashanti army had entered into the British Gold Coast with a great deal of equipment, ammunition, and food. However, Aman Kwasha had prepared for this war with the understanding that these supplies were only to last them a few months, until they could capture Cape Coast and Accra, and then resupply with loot and material from these cities. But, of course, that never happened. So, since the offensive had stalled in October, the Ashanti had basically been consuming food, guns, ammunition, and achieving nothing for it. In fact, by early November, British battlefield reports indicate that food shortages were starting to become chronic within their Ashanti foes, and desertions were becoming an endemic problem. With Ashanti soldiers dying or deserting by the truckloads, Aman Kwasha decided that the best course of action was to retreat. Aman Kwasha once again begged the Ashanti Hane to allow him to pull back across the Pra River, which Kakari again harshly rebuked. The king scolded Aman Kwasha, saying in his words, you wished for war, and you have it. You swore that you would not return until you brought me the walls of Cape Coast, and now you want me to recall you because some officers have fallen and you are suffering? It was not I, but you, who wished for war. Kakari closed this note with a harsh demand. If Aman Kwasha wanted to return to Komasi, he had to pledge that he his officers, and every other Omanhene and Ansafohene who had voted for the war would reimburse the full cost of the conflict in its entirety. Remember, outfitting these armies wasn't cheap, and the Ashanti weren't exactly swimming in money at the time. So, you want to come back? You need to pay the government back for the cost of this whole debacle. Kakari brought this demand to the Ashanti Mashyamu. He informed the attendees, especially those who had pushed him to war, that Aman Kwasha was now demanding for his own return, and that they should fork over the money to compensate for the cost of the war. The pro-war delegates were humiliated by the failure of their champion, and sheepishly agreed to pay for the debacle. The order had been given, and the Ashanti began to retreat back across the Pra. However, while Aman Kwasha generally followed the order to retreat, you know, the one that he had asked for, there was one matter that he had to attend to first. The town of Abrakampa had, during the Ashanti offensive, acted entirely uncooperative. Abrakampa's king had refused to hand over his food stores to the Ashanti, which had enraged Aman Kwasha, but at the time, there had been more important matters to attend to further south. But now that his army was retreating, he decided to take some time to punish the king of Abrakampa and his subjects. The Ashanti army began ransacking and burning the town. However, this proved to be a mistake. The momentary pause in the retreat to destroy Abrakampa had given Wolseley's army time to catch up with the withdrawing Ashanti. As the British advanced towards Abrakampa, the Ashanti officers did the smart thing and retreated, allowing the British to take the half-ruined town. Apparently, though, the town hadn't actually been destroyed enough for the liking of Aman Kwasha. He rebuked his officers and ordered an uncharacteristic decision for Ashanti generals, a head-on assault. Aman Kwasha struck the British with a flurry of well-coordinated attacks at their front. 
The plan went perfectly. The Ashanti caught the shocked British off guard, and they were sent into a disorderly retreat. However, supply problems that were beginning to become a chronic issue raised their head. You see, the Ashanti army was, by this point, incredibly short on gunpowder. Amun Kwasha rationed the gunpowder among his men, allowing them only to fill their weapons with a fraction of the proper amount of gunpowder. As a result, Ashanti gunfire was practically not gunfire at all. The projectiles they launched came at an incredibly weak, slow trajectory, and bounced off the British, leaving only painful welts. At this point in the war, Amun Kwasha's forces might as well be armed with powerful BB guns. Several dozen British were wounded during the attack, and had the Ashanti been properly equipped with powder, the casualties could have been considerable. However, the poor state of Ashanti powder supply meant that only one man who was hit in the eye was actually marked as a casualty unfit for service. And yes, armed with what I guess you could call powerful BB guns, you could say that the Ashanti shot his eye out. ba dum -tsh. After withstanding this flaccid attack, the British turned around and routed the Ashanti. The British attempted to capitalize on their victory at Abrakampa by harassing Ashanti lines, but these probing attacks were unproductive and ended up taking more British lives than Ashanti. So by the end of November, the Ashanti armies were safely back across the Pra River in Ashantemon. To the Ashanti government, the failure to capture Almina marked the end of the war. They had tried to retake Almina, failed, and spent a lot of money and lives doing it. It was embarrassing. The anti-war faction was vindicated. Afwa Kobe and Otto Beaufort both spent plenty of time rubbing the failure in the face of the pro-war faction, letting them know, we told you so. In the Ashanti Manshamu, the delegates began debating what they should and shouldn't include in a peace offer to the British. The first idea was to withdraw all forces from the Cape Coast. Okay, well, we've already done that, so check. The next idea was to release the prisoners that the Ashanti held. This is where things got a little more complicated. So, everyone agreed that if any prisoners would be released, the captured missionaries and merchants were the obvious first priority. They were the most important captives to the British, and the Ashanti hadn't ever really had much beef with them to begin with. However, what about prisoners of war? Remember, during the early stages of the war, the Ashanti had won some victories, and taken pretty large numbers of prisoners. So, would the Ashanti release them too? After some debate, the answer that the Ashanti Manshiamu settled on was some, but not yet. British and Caribbean soldiers would be released in the future after the war was officially over. Fanti and Hausa captives, well, they would be sold into slavery or ransomed off to the British, whichever fetched a higher price. So, in late November, the captive missionaries and merchants were called into the Ashanti Manshiamu's meeting place, and informed by Kakari himself that they were set to be released. One of the missionaries made the poor choice to inquire about the fate of British and Fanti POWs, to which Kakari grew defensive and declared that, you know, we don't have to release anyone. The missionary quickly shut his mouth and thanked the king for their release. Preparations were made, and it would take a while, but by December, the captives are ferried across the Pra and back into British custody. However, this was a feeble exercise, as Wolseley had no intention to accept any peace offer. As fresh reinforcements continued to trickle into the Gold Coast, the size of the British garrisons in the region swelled immensely. In early November, the British had numbered just under 2,000 men garrisoned in the entire Gold Coast. By the end of the month, the British numbered over 10,000 when you include Fonti recruits and Hausa mercenaries. Crucially, unlike the retreating Ashanti, the British were incredibly well supplied. Wolseley, a man whose claim to fame was his logistical skills, had wasted no effort in arranging for the soldiers under his command to receive great quantities of supplies. Hundreds of thousands of cases of ammunition, gunpowder, thousands of rifles, and millions of packages of dried meat all arrived in Cape Coast through November and December. Perhaps most importantly, Wolseley also imported millions of cases of quinine. Quinine is a really important substance, not only in the Third Anglo-Ashanti War, but in the history of European imperialism in Africa more generally. Quinine is a chemical found in a few species of flowers throughout South America, and is pretty chemically similar to the remedies that the Akan had long used for malaria. For centuries, the native people of Peru, Colombia, and Central America used the ground-up plant as an anti-malarial herb, a practice which they eventually taught to the Spanish Jesuit missionaries that lived among them. However, the plant didn't really spread much in popularity outside of southern Europe until the mid-19th century. 
The plant from which the material came was really only available in Peru, and the Peruvian government was quite stingy about who they exported to and at what price. Around 1850, though, Dutch planters decided to invest in plantations for harvesting quinine, partially to support their own growing colonial regime in Indonesia. This venture proved incredibly successful, and by the 1870s, the medication was widely available as a commercial product in Europe for the first time. However, the anti-malarial drug was not very popular among European soldiers. Side effects of the drug in its isolated form included head-splitting migraines, partial blindness, heart palpitations, and extreme nausea. Not as bad as untreated malaria, but, well, still awful enough that officers often struggled to convince their soldiers to take it. Wolseley, however, was a major proponent for the use of quinine. Like, he absolutely loved this stuff. Earlier in his career as a general, he had been a big player in convincing the British Army to adopt numerous reforms, and one of these reforms was the widespread adoption of quinine in malaria-heavy areas. During the Ashanti campaign, he would develop a reputation for being notoriously strict about quinine dosage. At the start of each day, he would make his officers line up and take their daily quinine under his supervision, then instruct them to do the same with their men. The dosages were quite large, way too high by today's medical standards, and it made the soldiers absolutely miserable. However, even migraines and partial blindness were preferable to Wolseley than his soldiers being out of commission or dying from malaria. It was a good thing for the British that Wolseley was so adamant about the adoption of quinine. By the conclusion of the Third Anglo-Ashanti War, more than half of all British soldiers in his army will have contracted malaria during the fighting, including Wolseley himself. However, unlike in previous wars, the majority of these men survived. Had it not been for Wolseley's devotion to quinine administration, an outbreak of this size would have been severe enough to slow or even fully derail the British war effort. Wolseley also modified British uniforms substantially. The old red uniforms so associated with British colonial armies were not suitable for war in Ghana. Their scarlet coloration was not at all acceptable for camouflage in bush fights, while their woolly texture resulted in a miserable lack of airflow. During previous wars, overheating from marching around in these wool uniforms in a tropical climate had exacerbated the symptoms of disease that were all too common. So, Wolseley scrapped them. In their stead, the troops were given drab, loose-fitting uniforms. The uniform's black caps were replaced with cork helmets. This would be the uniform under which the British fought in Ghana, as well as the uniform under which they would colonize much of Africa and Asia. Between the new emphasis on medical and supply logistics, the use of new, more climate-appropriate uniforms, and the new repeating rifles, the Third Anglo-Ashanti War is widely viewed as the first true modern conflict in British history. This was the opposite case for the Ashanti. Not only had their army remained stagnant in terms of logistics or battlefield technology since the reign of Kwakojoa, in many ways it had actively gotten worse. So far, though, the most obvious cause of the Ashanti's failure was a lack of mid-level officer talent. In multiple occasions throughout the early stages of the war, we've seen the Ashanti army be on the brink of victory, only for a lack of discipline, morale, or coordination to fail them. Think of those skirmishes outside of Elmina, where Ashanti officers failed to get their men in position, so they kind of just randomly fired in the air. Or the failed siege of Elmina. When armies lack discipline and coordination, typically blame for this is placed on the field officers. And this is the part where we remember how many talented officers and generals Kakari had purged at the start of his reign. I really bet that he wished that he had all those guys back. The bigger problem, though, was certainly one of production. As the Ashanti had invaded the south, the army consumed a lot, and I mean a lot, of guns, powder, and ammunition. In past wars, this consumption would be offset by bringing new weapons to the front. There was a small but thriving firearm manufacturing industry in Ashantimon, and traditionally this would be supplemented by arms sales from the Danish or Dutch. But they're out of town, so the Ashanti are mostly on their own, aided only by a few illegal British arms smugglers. And the Ashanti manufacturing industry is not going to be able to come close to filling the demands for guns, powder, and most of all, ammunition. This problem even exacerbated the technological gap between the British and Ashanti, as the shortage of recently manufactured firearms forced many Ashanti soldiers to pick out old, retired models that were lying around. As we'll see, this shortage of firearms and ammunition will be, much more than any single factor, what decides the outcome of this conflict. And so, we close out the year 1873 with things looking very grim for the Ashanti. 
British numbers continue to swell in the south, while Amon Quash's weakened armies have now retreated north of the Pra and continue to struggle with chronic supply and discipline issues. Join us next episode as the Third Anglo-Ashanti War continues to heat up, and the war transforms from humiliating to apocalyptic. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then we would love it if you could support the show. You can do this through supporting us monetarily at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing the show with a rating or a view on whichever platform you listen on, or sharing the show with anyone who you think might be interested in learning more about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Morgan Blackmore, Sarah Mpenza, Tobias Tungland, Dimitri, Emmanuel Zaudi, Alexander Travis, B.B. Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Travis Bell, Johnny Knowles, Ose Kwame, Lucia Plesha, and Godfrey Sebelabie, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really means a lot. Oh, and uh, shout out to Lucia. Thank you for the very interesting and thought-provoking email. It was a pleasure replying to it.